Hi everyone, thanks for attending today's roundtable conversation on digital menu boards put on by the Digital Signage Federation. My name is Ryan Cohoy uh, with Rise Vision and I'll be the moderator for today's panel. Uh, joining me on the panel, uh, I've got several industry experts at digital signage as well as menu boards with George Eunice from Allure Global, Rich Pirro from Premier Mounts, and Frank Krug from TPN Retail. Um, I'll let each of those gentlemen introduce themselves here in, in more detail in, in just a few moments as we get into the roundtable conversation. Um, we we want to encourage an open, lively, interactive conversation as we go through things today. So um, we, we definitely encourage you to put your questions in. You should see a toolbar on the right side of your screen that says questions, and at the very bottom, a big green button that says ask a new question. Put any thoughts, any uh, ideas, any feedback in there, um, and our, our panelists would love to expand on those. If you see other questions going in that are of interest to you, feel free to vote them up as well. Um, if for any reason you don't see that toolbar, uh, look towards the top of your screen, and there's probably nine dots. If you click on that, it should open a little app navigator, and you'll see a little blue Q&A. If you open that up, it should give you that toolbar. If for whatever reason that doesn't work, um, if you want to go back to the original Google Hangouts um, or a Google Events page that you signed up for this on, there is a question uh, or an Ask Anything box there. We're going to moderate from there as well. So you know, however you can get us the questions, uh, just uh, feel free to fire those in. Um, as I mentioned, all this is put on by the Digital Signage Federation. Uh, if you haven't been out to the website for a while, I'd encourage you to check it out. A lot of great resources uh, out there for vertical market information, uh, case studies, photos, examples. Um, and I'd encourage you if, you, if you have case studies or if your organizations put them together or any content or anything you're willing to share, we're always looking to feed the beast and put more resources out on our website. So uh, I'll put up a couple of email addresses here in a few moments. But if you have anything you'd like to share for uh, the Digital Signage Federation website, uh, we'd love anything that you can, can share with us. Um, and for those of you that are interested in you know, seeing what's going on out there, I haven't updated this capture, so I apologize the dates are in advance, but um, check out the DSF events. Uh, there's always uh, meetups, uh, networking nights, uh, upcoming conferences. So check that out if you're looking for a calendar event so where you can go out and hang out with other people that are interested in the digital signage space. And again, all that's out at the website, digitalsignagefederation.com. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Ryan Coy with Rise Vision. I co-chair the education subcommittee with Spencer Graham from West Virginia University. And we try to put on one of these hangouts uh, each month on a variety of different topics. But we're always looking for ideas, panelists, uh, any feedback of what people want to see. So my email address is on the screen there. Jot that down if you have an idea for a topic, if you'd be interested in sitting on a panel, sharing your experiences, your ideas. Um, please shoot those to me. We're always looking for new ideas as we're planning out our, our agenda for into next year. I'm also going to throw up Brian Gorg and Jerry Wolf from the Digital Signage Federation. Their email addresses are on the screen. We're a volunteer organization, so um, if you're not a member, first off, we'd encourage you to join in, you know, help participate, give a voice to the digital signage community. Um, but also get involved if you'd like to, you know, again, take part in these panels, if you'd like to chair a subcommittee, you'd like to help with membership. There's all kinds of roles that need to be filled, and we're always looking for those that want to get involved. So uh, shoot Brian or Jerry an email and uh, let them know what you're interested in. <clears throat> and again, before we get into the panel conversation here, one additional plea for questions. Uh, these are always a lot more fun for me and the panelists if we're getting questions and we have a, a lively and interactive conversation. So anything you want to know more about uh, digital signage, menu boards, hardware, software, content, you name it, um, you know, our panel of experts has a little bit of expertise everywhere. So fire those questions in. So with that, I'm going to uh, get things kicked off here and uh, start with our panel. I'll start with you, Frank, if you want to uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your company, your background with digital signage. Sure. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, so my name is Frank Krug. I am the director of retail technology at TPN Retail. Um, TPN Retail has been around for about 30 years. We're a shopper marketing agency. Um, major clients, Bank of America, 7-Eleven, Comcast, uh, CPG clients, um, like Sally Beauty, um, Sara Lee, Jockey, Barilla, um, been, been around a long time. Uh, I started in 
this business uh, back sort of at the beginning of digital signage and digital menu boards in particular. Uh, worked on the team that developed the first digital menu board for McDonald's, uh, as well as the flight information display systems, kind of those screens that you see behind the gate agents at, at United Airlines. So kind of worked on the teams uh, developing those products and then was responsible for the opera, 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 operationalization of those. Oh, great word, huh? Um, so I've uh, been, been around a while, took a, took a little bit of a left turn, uh, worked in the music business and the technology startup uh, area for a while. And about four years ago, uh, Bank of America engaged TPN to help them select uh, and implement a new digital signage system in 2,500 of their 5,000 retail locations. Uh, so that was, that was kind of how I got my start here. Uh, we went on to develop their content strategy, content creation, uh, distribution, uh, measuring efficacy, adjusting messaging, so on and so forth. About two years ago, 7-Eleven um, engaged us to work on their next generation stores, uh, prototype stores uh, that were very technology centric. So uh, in addition to digital menu boards, there were four other digital touch points uh, in the store. One was an exterior facing screen, which uh, which was made to draw people in, uh, gave them information about weather, uh, metro traffic, uh, national promotions, appetite appeal shots to draw people in for uh, for food. Um, and then there was sort of an entertainment zone in the seating area and then also information at the cash wrap. So I uh, worked on that project and then most recently uh, working on uh, Comcast uh, who has 300 retail locations and, and have helped with the digital network there with content strategy and content creation. Excellent. Well, thanks for that. I'll turn it to you, George, if you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and the things you guys are doing at Allure. Oh, you're still muted, George. Yep, just turning around now. Um, George is with Allure Global, and I got my start really in the industry about nine years ago on the end user side, operating, uh, really founding and helping to build a, a network that is used by a major food service organization now in hundreds and hundreds of locations ranging from healthcare and higher ed to stadiums to corporate campuses. Um, came to Allure Global and, uh, and came here really to help with our efforts around optimization of content, particularly in the areas of menus and merchandising of food and beverage, and then also really build an analytics practice around uh, measuring, you know, effectively measuring the successful and challenges, successes and challenges and opportunities, but also being able to really define and attribute success to the menu boards. And that's really what we do a lot of in our focus. Um, Allure's been around in the space for about 10 years, actually almost exactly 10 years right now in digital signage. We also have a strong footprint in point of sale. And uh, we really focus in a few areas, uh, restaurant, so QSR, food service, fast casual, that kind of thing. We also have a very strong footprint in the theater industry, a strong footprint in state stadiums and arenas and convention centers, and then lastly, uh, theme parks, cultural attractions, that kind of thing. Much of our work is really geared around food and beverage and or retail. Um, beyond that, uh, and we have about 100, I don't know, 150, 160 clients, um, pretty significant size clients in many cases, all the way down to some small ones. Um, and then our focus really in the last two to three years has really been micro focused around what's called data, what we call data driven design. And that means using data to inform and to influence the design, but also obviously guest behavior and being able to really help clients achieve their business results, both the obvious ones like increased lift or increased average uh, per transaction, those kind of things, but really also helping them with just brand and differentiation and experience in store. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Excellent. Great. And last but not least, Rich, I'll let you tell us some of the exciting things uh, you've been involved with and what you do at Premier. Okay. So Rich Pirro, uh, co-CEO of Premier Mounts, uh, going on two years now is in that position, but I came to Premier Mounts about 10 years ago uh, where I went ahead and moved my, my manufacturing and design company to California to start the manufacturing and custom design uh, unit for Premier Mounts. And so I spent the last, well, first eight years in the industry, uh, typically with uh, hotel properties like Wynn properties from here to Macau, China. And so we did a, a lot of custom uh, projects, gold coated projects, everything from guest services, guest rooms, uh, digital signage in the gambling space, 
and then uh, security as well. So most recently we've done uh, big projects this year have been with Target, uh, Daytona International Speedway, and we're currently working on uh, another wind property in Macau, China right now. So uh, our, our goal is to help our integrator partners and our OEM partners be successful in the deployment of uh, mounting solutions for uh, digital technology. And so with that, if we can get on site and in project discussions early, we can take all the information, all the data, and then relate it to the actual project rollout. Who's, who's installing? What, what are they uh, taking with them? Are they taking a truck or a bag of tools? Uh, will they have ladders? Things like that. And anything that we can do to make their job easier and faster, uh, it, it helps us bring a lot of value to the overall project rather than just the product itself. So you find us involved very early in the process. Excellent. Well, thanks. Well, I just want to remind everyone, um, we're going to get started with uh, a few initial questions, but uh, feel free to start firing those questions into the uh, questions box on the side there, and we'll uh, get to uh, your topics. So I'm going to start off with you, Frank. Um, really generic, open-ended question. Why go digital? What are some of the advantages of remotely managing this other than I can just change it quickly? Sure. Uh, there's, there's so many reasons to go digital. I, I, I barely know where to start. Uh, first of all, it's just a better customer experience, right? I think people have come to expect that sort of really neat, clean look as opposed to walking in where there is a menu board and, and sort of handmade signs and letters that aren't aligned and just, just looks better. Um, we've got the opportunity to do all sorts of great things with appetite, appetite appeal shots. So uh, a nice hamburger sizzling on the grill, uh, Coke being poured down over ice on a hot day, all those things that are going to contribute to to sales lift, right? So kind of achieving some of those objectives. Um, we've got the ability to put tools in the hands of the local store managers to respond to local needs while still maintaining brand guidelines. So, for example, if I know that uh, the QSR across the street is running a promotion and they're killing me because I see all the lunch traffic going over there and not to me. I can make changes on my menu board with a special offer, but I can have corporate can still control what that offer is. So for example, I can never offer a cheeseburger at less than a dollar. So the system kind of controls the, the, the price points there, right? I can't, I can't deviate from those and still maintain the brand guidelines. So I can't just go put up some handmade sign. I, I pull from a list of sort of pre-approved assets that the, the company has, has put out there for me. And then operationally, if we look at it, we've, we've got the things like um, speed to market, as you mentioned, um, compliance. So making sure that the right promotions, national promotions, are up, they're up properly, they're up on time. So it's sort of like right message, right place, right time. Um, and, and I don't think that we can discount that sort of um, quick response that you just, you just talked about. If we look at uh, instances that have happened in the past where there's some disruption to the food chain or some threat to the food chain, you know, Mad Cow, for example, where, you know, the, the, there's some health threat, we're able to quickly respond to that by removing any of those items from the menu board and changing the product mix so that business continues and there's not a complete loss of sales, right? Most importantly, I think with the new FDA regulations that are, that are coming up, I think it's going to be next to impossible to try to navigate without digital menu boards. Digital menu boards were made for this very reason. Perfect. I'll throw the same question at you, Rich. I mean, you get involved pretty early on in projects, it sounds like. So why are your clients looking at going digital? What are the benefits? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you, the opportunities are, opportunities are endless, but two consistent things that have been coming up lately is that uh, they, they, they see a certain product category sales is up overall, but the product uh, specific product is down. So they say things like, well, we want to just grow this one product, We'll, we'll do the same thing with the other products, but in terms of screen placement, where would you suggest that we put this? And so we'll go on site to help them do uh, screen placement and, and advise at that level as well. But um, they also say we'd like to capture our audience at the street level. 
or even in the car and entice them to come into our store using digital signage. So they're talking beacon technology. How do they get uh, the, the attention of their uh, potential customers at the street level on their mobile devices? Great. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about some of the best practices, and I'll, I'll start with you, George. Um, you know, obviously, one of the benefits of going digital is day parting. What are some of the best practices to effectively take advantage of that? Well, you know, there there as any as with anything, there's a number of ways that you can try to take advantage of digital signage, depending on your brand, depending on your customer base, and and your business model. But realistically, I think. Um, day parting for us represents an opportunity to really custom or customize the experience, the offering, and really speak to your guests based on who they, who, what, who and what they are basically in terms of a demographic and the way that they use or enjoy your brand and your products and order your, from your menu. So realistically we all know that there are different day parts have different audience bases. So children and families are in at different times and let's say single 18 to 25 year olds might be coming in. And so the ability to just cater to the, to the different audience first on, on a pure experience basis, parts of the menu, offers, um, price points, of course, those kinds of things can all be geared around those customers. Now, that assumes that the, the, our client or the brand or the restaurant group or whatever understands who their clients are and how they're using the facility. But if they aren't totally sure of that, they're guessing a little bit as well as using some data, um, there are a lot of ways to measure that and understand that. And so that's very important, I think, from the point of view of day party. The other big piece is really being able to kind of communicate offers that are really customized not only from the menu perspective but um, uh, as Frank mentioned and you mentioned the FDA piece even nutritionally just really starting to speak to guests on the nutritional level is a great way to really tie in day parting because again that that audience that's at lunch or at dinner or whatever it might be on a weekend versus a weekday um, one last quick sort of suggestion with this and that we do is we really dive into the data to understand not only what people are buying as their center of plate item or the core, but also what they're most likely to tend to buy in addition to that if prompted or influenced. And so we really like day parting from that perspective. So it's more than just knowing to serve breakfast you know, all day long or at breakfast only, but it's also understanding when they buy the breakfast combo, they might actually buy a, a sundae or a parfait or whatever in the morning, but at night they might actually buy an actual ice cream dessert or product. So there's a lot of ways you can use it beyond simply just saying, hey, old people go at this time, young people go at that time, and women or men go more often here or there. Just well, kind of one of follow I'm sorry. Uh, I'll give you a second, just a, uh, a second here, Frank. Uh, one follow-up question to you, George, that just came in, uh, just to get your opinion on is, if they're currently using digital menus with static images, um, what do you suggest is the next addition to get the most attention from the guest? So I think my my instinctual answer is that it, it's probably menu boards, but there are times, depending on the menu itself, that a merchandiser may be more effective to get started as a transition. So you may want to start out by keeping, uh, let's say, your static menu boards for whatever reasons, cost or operational change or whatever, and maybe include one or two merchandisers or digital screens that are promoting your core items, your limited time offers, and so forth, and get comfortable with or get used to that, but also drive some real impact on the menu. We've seen a number of clients who have done that with some success. We would argue that if you do that, you might as well also experiment right away and test your, your you know, a digital menu board strategy and understand that the, some of your locations may be better with just the DMB or digital menu board, some with merchandise or some with a combination. But I, I would argue that you, know, you have really two options to go depending on your menu, how complex it is, and what you're trying to get the guests to do first in the short term. Great. So I'll kick it to you, Frank, and I'll, I'll give you the two-part question. Same thing that went to George is, you know, some, some of your opinions on best practice around day parting, but then also if you have any suggestions to this uh, question on where to go next from static messages. Sure. I think uh, day parting in QSR in particular um, is is starting to be rethought a little bit, right? If you look at uh, traditionally, day parting in, in QSR has been pretty simple, right? It's breakfast from 6 to 11, 12 on Saturday and Sunday when I'm running a little later. Um, 
lunch from 12 to 5, and then dinner from 5 on. Uh, product mix between lunch and dinner is pretty similar, but the offer might change up and be a little more family-focused at night, so it's sort of a meal deal, you know, targeting four people, uh, whereas at lunch it's, you know, just more of a single thing. Um, but what we're seeing is companies like McDonald's, who's always kind of been the, one of the category leaders here, undoubtedly, right, um, is starting to offer breakfast all day. Um, so, so that traditional day part is starting to change a little bit. I think day parting is really needs to be thought of more locally. Um, and George was sort of alluding to this with like the analytics, right? It's all about knowing your audience. A couple examples. So uh, the store, uh, the 7-Eleven Next Gen store in the financial district here in New York has a, a very diverse audience. It's all about that local store manager knowing the audience and having the ability to respond to their audience. So you have this mix of Wall Street people, right, who to them breakfast is at 5.30, but you had a night shift of hospital people who were getting off at that same time. So that was dinner time for them. Right, so day partying in the financial district might be different than day partying in a college town. So it's all about getting as much information as you possibly can locally and hyper locally where you can, and being able to respond with your product mix and your day partying from there. And then going to the the question about what's the next logical iteration from static images. Um, if you've already got your digital menu board and you've got those static images up there, it's a, it's a great start. My next choice would probably be to start integrating some appetite appeal shots. So the appetite appeal shots are just sort of a proven performer with with sales lift. Great. Um, I'll stay with you, Frank, for just a second here on a, a follow-up question that just came in. Um, the question is that they found that their company creates content for menu boards. The font size is really critical. Older customers need larger fonts. Um, they're looking for some guidance in terms of issues you come across and best practices. So I'll start with you, Frank. Yeah, sure. Um, it's there's a <laughs> it's sort of a, a, a creative challenge, right? And it's a you've got a couple problems. You've got you've got a real estate issue. You only have limited screen size. You've got uh, creative issues where you want it to look good and then you've got this whole readability, legibility uh, issue which is in particular for, for older people. Um, what what I've you always want to do um, fonts that have uh, serif if if possible right so it's e it's easier to read. Um, there are also some guidelines, federal guidelines about how large and small that type can actually be. Um, one of the things that I've seen uh, implemented recently, which I think is is really really smart, is they are starting to use the same real estate more effectively and kind of making this up. If there are seven or eight, if there are eight menu items, for example, on one screen, what they will do is they will highlight several of them momentarily, sort of uh, sort of glide through them, and as each of them are highlighted, the font uh, gets bigger, and that particular sandwich or menu item is highlighted becomes bigger. So it's almost like putting a magnifying glass over over each of them. So it's a really clever way to solve creatively for that issue. Great. I'll kick the same question to you, George. Any advice on font sizes? Yeah, I, I, I guess I would just echo what Frank just mentioned. Um, what we typically try to do is, you know, we try to manage that lowest common denominator. So, really understanding what's the smallest you can go. To be candid, a lot of clients really push for a lot of information on those menus, and if you just ignore the FDA menuing compliance piece, but even without that, um, typically the dilemma is too few screens for the amount of menu. And then the ability to um, put a lot of information in there at a small size is sometimes so irresistible to a lot of our, our, our food and beverage clients. So what we really try to do is try to, to sort of help them understand that the menu is not a, it's not a democracy. There are really, as is, is in life, 20% of all of us and of all menu items do 80% of the work or more. And so you, you really need to be able to focus on those items, um, I think, as a strategy that are the, the drivers of your menu with a little bit more real estate, a little bit larger size, and so forth. And then understand with your audience, maybe you need a 55-inch screen instead of a 47-inch screen or a 42. And I think those are real simple things. And then what Frank talked about, those tactics, I think really work. You just have to sometimes be careful with the way that it can disrupt the, the 
disrupt the experience overall on the menu. But I think those are neat ideas as well for how to highlight items and information and font, you know, the, the actual text piece of it. Great. Um, you know, so Ryan, I might, I might jump in on that real quick. What I've seen with uh, some of our projects is that's a concern as well, but what they're doing in part rather than the software, they're addressing the physical location of the screens. So whereas their static boards were pushed back away from the counter, maybe above the fry vat, um, now they're pushing the digital menu boards up flush with the, with the counter space so it's closer to the viewer and tilted down closer to them as well. So those are some of the physical things that, that we see happening. Great. Well, I think that kind of leads into next topic here, and I'll start with you, Rich, is um, marketing. Like, what are some of the things you're seeing as marketing is getting in, in, engaged in this for promotional campaigns or... Uh, like you mentioned, screen placement. What what does marketing want to see out of this? Well, you know, so I I look at some of the unique applications that really make me go wow. And uh, you know, Pizza Hut's interactive tabletop, allowing you to build a pizza at the table, was something I thought was really creative uh, from a marketing standpoint because it really got their engagement and participation, and it it, it made it fun. And I, I watched people do it, and they were actually going there as an attraction just because they were engaging with the menu. Uh, the other thing I see is to decrease uh, wait times, the perceived wait times at the lines. So one company actually had a, a board, an independent board by itself that people were uh, streaming their social media up to the screen and getting interaction there. So, Excellent. Well, I think that kind of leads to a question that came in that uh, I'll throw at you, George, is, um, and this is from our friends at Data Call, so they know data. Um, how about using weather data to lift sales? So, for example, if the temp is reaches a certain uh, temperature and it says cold, let's promote hot chocolate. Uh, have you seen any success around tactics like that? Yeah, so so that's always been something that people think about and kind of use as kind of a, a classic example, right, of conditions or of circumstances that can affect behavior that are external to the menu or the menu boards and so forth. Um, another one along with that would be, let's say, at a stadium, you know, certain point in the game. Um, but when it comes to uh, the weather or you know those factors, I mean, if you're able to integrate, I think if you're starting out, I would say it's probably an integration piece that you might want to wait a little bit to sort of tackle. But on the other hand, if you've got a platform that, that, that supports it well, I think the ability to go in and put in some of those what we might call factors or variables that affect behaviors. In our case, we've done more, like I say, with what we would call event parting or moment parting. Um, versus, you know, let's say weather parting, and so um, we haven't done as much of that, but I know I've seen that done fairly regularly and with some success, and clearly around things like hot beverages, cold beverages, ice cream, desserts, those kind of things. Okay. Well, it's kind of along this path. Let's talk about point of sale integration. Um, is it necessary? Is it complex? What advice do you have? And I'll, I'll start with you, Frank. Uh, any experience there? Sure. Um, is it necessary? I, I think it's absolutely necessary. I think uh, for several reasons. Um, to manage, basically, it, it's two. It's two disparate databases. You've got your point of sale data, which is going to contain the price for the number one meal, and then you've got your uh, content management system that is displaying the price for the number one meal on the menu board. And those two data sources have typically been independent. Um, trying to manage it operationally is really pretty difficult, and there's a, a huge opportunity for error, which then puts you out of compliance with federal law, right? You need to make sure that you're advertising the, the, the price of something, that you're charging the same price for what you're advertising. So. I think integrating those two things is really necessary. Technically, is it difficult? No, I probably have some developers ready to kill me, but it's really basically just two data sources where you're assigning one as the definitive source that the other pulls from. Clearly, that should be the point of sale data, right? And the digital menu board should reflect what that point of sale, uh, point of sale data is. The challenge has been that if you are a digital signage company, the point of sale people are not very happy about letting you into their system given the sensitivity with transaction data and, and so on and so forth. So I think, you know, if we just look at the whole omni-channel, the, the idea of omni-channel in general, right, I think there's a lot of those struggles going on behind the scenes for, for retailers of every type in terms of trying to come up with 
definitive data sources, right? It's storing all of the data for all of the reasons in, in one place. And I would add that we, we don't, we, we shouldn't just stop at point of sale integration. We need to start looking at things like um, CRM integration, so the customer relationship management database integration, so that we can start to do things like, like mobile. Um, it's, in a, it's just going to be an absolute critical piece, right? Getting mobile ordering integrated into the in-store experience, making that QSRs, uh, making that QSR the default choice because you've made it so easy for me to place my order and then pick it up in store and then kind of tacking on to George's point about you know knowing as much about our consumers I think we need to I need we need to be looking at things like shopper tracking so integrating shopper tracking right into the digital menu board so putting a camera behind that register that is capable of audience recognition so when that mom with three kids is ordering the family meal at exactly three o'clock we can compare that that transaction that took at exactly three o'clock see what was ordered and see who was ordering it so that we can refine our product mix and and curate the, the right solutions for our, for our client great all right George so Frank says it's easy to integrate to point of sale what's your opinion <clears throat> Well, I, w I would say that it is easy on the surface, and I know he's already acknowledged, uh, clearly we're on the same page here. The actual integration isn't particularly complex from, let's say, the program or the code development piece, but it's usually just an API from the POS provider. The, the problem are the relationships with the POS providers, and Frank's already addressed that a little bit as well. I mean, the, the, I, I would say if you get a good POS provider who's comfortable with working with other systems in, in an integration kind of mode or environment, okay, great, you still have another problem. <laughs> and that problem, which is really updating, um, they'll all tell you it's easy to update. You know, they push POS updates down, and your system will pick those up, and it'll refresh. It's much more challenging than that. So those are kind of the bad news parts of it. But the good news is that it is almost... I mean, it, it's not even critical. It's beyond critical in terms of if you're going into the digital menuing space now or you're trying to implement digital menuing now and you've got any size of organization at all, you almost have to start by doing it with integration if you want to stay relevant and ahead and really gain all the benefit or many of the benefits. Um, I, if I could, I'll share just a, two simple examples of how we have leveraged integration um, in very different ways. One of those is really what we would call sort of systems integration with front and back of house. So we've integrated digital menu boards on our platform with a third-party POS provider with the kitchen display systems, so the production system in the restaurant. And we've been able to integrate those three in such a way that we're able to drive and promote on the screens inventory based on what's being produced and, that in, and then influence is being produced based on sales data, weather, and other factors, business rules that say, hey, on Tuesday nights versus Thursday mornings versus Halloween weekend uh, as opposed to Thanksgiving weekend, what happened a year ago, a month ago, a week ago, we're able to take that, those data inputs and we're able to literally drive what they produce by recommending the optimal mix and then constantly adjusting and, 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 and sort of um, right-sizing that, and then promoting on the screens based on that. And then if you think about that sort of a system, you're able to take product that may be about to expire and really heavily promote it for the last 60, 90, or 120 seconds before you have to pull it from the window, for example. And so that, that type of an integration is only enabled if you've begun with a POS integration. And it allows you now to integrate with other systems so much more easily. And the good news is, all the systems out there are getting smarter, and the people behind those systems are getting more experienced and more comfortable with this idea that we all have to collaborate on some level. Um, real quick, one other analogy or example really is in the theater space. We took a, an integration of data from POS and used it to inform the, the design process, and we did it on a basically about a four or five week cycle. And I think about, I don't know, 12, 13 million consumer transactions worth of data that we ended up processing over the course of like five months or so. And the point was we were able to figure out how to drive not only specific item sales most uh, optimally, but also even figure out what they ought to be pricing or how they ought to be discounting, I should say, um, a, a jumbo size soda from a large soda based on 
the, the region, the specific theater, and the guest behaviors on given days of the week. So there's a lot of things that start to open kind of doors for people when they integrate with POS, but there are challenges. So I would just tell you, understand your, your POS provider's willingness, as they say it, but also their history in integrating POS with digital signage. Have they ever done it? And then talk to the people they've done it with or the clients they've done it for and understand what you, what, what you can expect and maybe how you can best work with them and manage them to help your other partners like digital signage companies uh, be more effective. Perfect. So let's jump into the FDA side of things because I know that's a real hot topic. Uh, I'll start with you, Rich. You know, what, what are you seeing from your clients talking about FDA regulations? How does it fit in with digital signage and some of the things you're doing? Yeah, well, until they uh, announced the uh, new go live date of December of 2016, I saw a real panic to actually get it implemented this year. And so we saw a, a flood of uh, opportunities coming in with that being the driver of that new FDA regulation. So, um, it's a it's a great opportunity, but there's a lot of risk as well. So if they're going to push to have everything deployed in digital signage uh, or digital menu boards by 2016, uh, the risk comes in the way of human safety. Uh, from the equipment mounting perspective, we're going to see a 23 billion dollar digital signage uh, sector kind of emerge by 2020. And uh, that's going to push a lot of weight over the heads of public space, people, children. And so we take a look at that and say, with this opportunity comes risk. Our job becomes uh, how do we mitigate or minimize that risk for our partners, OEMs, and, and end users to make sure that uh, while this big flood of opportunity comes through the, the uh, channel, the market, that we don't accidentally have a, a mistake that causes uh, an injury or even a risk to human life. Okay. Frank, what's your perspective on FDA and uh, some of the regulations coming down the pipe? Sure. So, uh, so basically, in short, the FDA regulation is that, uh, uh, as Rich mentioned, by December of 2016, all menus need to display the calorie information for all of their products. So any restaurant that is uh, 20, I think it's 20 or more, um, needs to do that. I think digital signage is the, the perfect solution to solve that challenge for all sorts of reasons. Um, if we look at the calorie counts, uh, so some people have been doing this early on, right? So Subway, for example, used this as a, as a marketing thing, um, as a health, healthful, uh, healthful marketing thing. Um, others are sort of, you know, having to, having to respond to it. So um, calorie counts can vary from state to state. So the number one meal that has cheese on it in New York might have a completely different calorie count than the one in Wisconsin, because Wisconsin's cheese is better, for example. So how do we find a way to build a database that has all of the calorie information specific to each location and display it dynamically? So rather than trying to manage it proactively, build the database, pull from that database, and display it on the menu board. There's really just no way to do that on a, on a static menu board. It would be a nightmare, and people would just never be in compliance. So that, that's why I think digital menu board is, is going to just be the answer to that problem. Great. George, what's your opinion on the FDA requirements? Well, uh, you know, we've been all in the industry, we've been facing it for a long time. And, and before I came to uh, Allure, I was with, uh, as I said earlier, a large food service organization. And we were already trying to grapple with it back then, about five, six, seven years ago. And so the last delay, uh, the, the, the last postponement really was, I think, the last chance <laughs> for a lot of folks. I don't believe they'll, they'll extend past this December to initially start mandating compliance uh, and actually, you know, uh, making that happen. But I, I think it's a great opportunity, but it is it is very challenging. I think a lot of organizations have to really work. There's, the, there's sort of three buckets. There's the first bucket is make sure that your menu information is accurate, it's scalable, and it's actually being operationally delivered, and that's its own animal. And there are a number of companies 
algorithms out there that help with that kind of testing and that kind of validation of, of the menu information. But as Frank said, I mean, then being able to tie that into a, a manageable strategy around your menu, it, it may make some operators say, you know what, we're going to just shrink our menu down to keep it a little bit easier to manage. And others are going to say, hey, we've got the system, we can run with anything we'd like. What, what we're finding is it's a great opportunity to drive, instead of just healthy options, but really much more calibrated sort of promotional offers based on behavior. So there may be some, like for example myself, I'm by no stretch of the imagination thin, and I'm by no stretch of the imagination a vegetarian or vegan. However, I never drink sugared beverages, ever, and I haven't for 20 years probably. And so there might be a great way to, for them to promote still that, that big burger or maybe that great chicken sandwich with something that has a little bit of a better for you sort of angle and really create offers that are specifically catered to those day parts that we talked about earlier. And I think FDA menuing, having that information there and then attaching it to sales data gives you a chance to really create those connections with your guests. And a McDonald's would be a great example. They, we've all heard how they've suffered so much from the overall menuing kind of issues that they've had in their whole concept, but they might be able to get around that effectively if they were able to communicate real clearly to their individual subgroups of customers and, and ultimately to the individual, a, a menu that had a mixture of some of their more indulgent items but really was much more focused on the ones that weren't and then display accordingly. So there's a lot there to work with. There's a lot to do. Um, we've been in this space for a while working with the FDA the last year and a half very closely to understand and communicate a lot of this to our clients. and. And I would just say that you've really got to kind of figure out how and what is the frequency of menu informational change that you've got to deliver and then make sure your system can do that for you. Perfect. So I just want to remind everyone, uh, we're getting here towards the tail end of the conversation. So if you do have any last questions for our panelists, uh, throw those in and we'll uh, get to them here in just a moment. So while we're waiting for any final questions to come in, um, let's, let's talk a little bit about pitfalls. You know, everybody reads the success stories and the case studies and all the great positives that are out there, but what are the issues? Like, what's, you know, what's the one thing you'd advise somebody looking at menu boards to avoid or a common pitfall? With you, Rich. Oh, a big one for us is uh, shopping based on, on cost. And if I can just have those conversations early about understanding the whole rollout schedule, the, the full plan, a little more expensive product might decrease total cost of ownership as long as we can decrease the amount of installation time that they spend on site. That's, that's a big one for us. Safety is big. If, if we see them shopping on, on price and at risk safety, I'd almost walk away from an opportunity before I sold them the, the cheapest product. Uh, those, those are big for us. Uh, we, we look at aesthetics too. Um, and this may not be a pitfall, but take advantage of uh, custom bezels that might uh, surround the menu board that lends itself to branding. Uh, it also covers up the aesthetic issues that you might see in spaces where it's visible into the back of the panel where cables start to fall down and drape down into food items. I've seen that. Uh, so those are some of the, the, the pitfalls I see. Great. Same question to you, George. What's uh, the thing you advise your clients to address first? Yeah, I think I think it's the the rush to judgment is the pitfall. It's we're all so worried about a nine month, six month, twenty month ROI, and we're all worried about seeing the returns right away. And and I would just say that it's like a sport. I mean, you're rarely a superstar right away. Changing from print menu boards to digital menu boards is a completely different skill set operationally, strategically, and so on. And so I would just counsel people to be patient. I mean, once you, once you go down this path, the thought that you're going to go back, it's kind of like, let's say, once you had power windows in cars, the idea that we're all going to go back to roll up windows is was pretty much dead. And it's the same kind of thing. I mean, once you've gone to digital menu boards, you don't question, should I go back to print? The issue is, am I, am I really executing this effectively? Am I, am I really using it as well as I could? Am I learning and studying what's going on so I can improve what I do? So it's really about patience. That's the biggest pitfall and this, this sense that we have to be like the stock market. We have to see a return in you know, 30, 60, 90 days. I think that is the number one pitfall. Hmm. That's great advice. Frank, same question to you. What, uh, what advice do you have? Uh, so from a 
I, I want to probably amplify Rich's point about don't don't do it based on price. I think that you need to engage a cross-functional team when you're thinking about doing this. You need to talk to your local store managers about what it is that they need. It can't be a decision uh, made solely by IT, uh, by marketing, uh, based on price. You, you need to engage all of those people to find out what their needs and requirements are, and um, it 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 will it will pay off. You need to make sure that you get the the right system uh, the first time. Uh, you will if you do not do that, you will find yourself in a situation where you have missed a, a key feature or functionality um, that that you really could have used in your business. From a content perspective, I think one of the things would be um, don't ever do anything that will impact line times, right? Getting the most amount of people through the line in the shortest amount of time is, is what drives sales. That's where the money comes from. So I think there's this whole idea a lot of times of we've got this really cool digital menu board and we can do all this cool stuff. I, I know one, one case in particular living in Chicago when the Bulls were, were in the playoffs, um, we were doing full screen takeovers of Michael Jordan dribbling down the court across, you know, four screens and it was amazing and people were talking about it and it was fantastic. The great, the bad news was there were no menu items up on the menu board at that time and so the line kind of came to a stop which created frustration and, you know, people were waiting longer for their food and, and sales actually declined instead of doing what they were supposed to do which was go up. So, um, you know, short, short, uh, short, succinct messages that, that don't interrupt line times. Great. Well, I don't see any other questions that came in, so I'm going to assume everybody was wowed by all of your brilliance and the, the great answers you guys gave. So with that, let's let's move to just kind of wrap up, and I'll start with you, Frank. Um, if you want to share any closing thoughts, any little tidbits of information, keys to take away for our audience today? Uh, I think I think probably just reiterating some of the stuff that we talked about. It, you know, if if this is a project that you're looking at at taking on, if you're just in that phase right now, um, hire hire a professional to come in and consult with you to help you develop your RFP to help you implement. Don't try to do it yourself. Uh, just because it's uh, computers that are driving this computers and screens doesn't mean that it's an IT initiative. Um, you know, take your time to make the take your time to make the right choice. Uh, invest in shopper tracking tools uh, so that you know your customer, and then put the tools in the hands of the local star manager. The local star manager is the one who knows their clients, who knows what they want, and give them the tools in order to to service their clients. Great. Same question to you, George. Any key takeaways? Yeah, you know what I think. I think is something that sometimes gets lost in the shuffle is what I would kind of call organizational fit with your partners. Um, there are so many good companies out there in our space, but the reality is that some organizations are more ready than others for certain types of solutions. And so I think it's really important to understand sort of the size of the organization in terms of the kinds of clients in the rest, what kind of restaurant brands or food service you know, organizations they're working with, and what are their typical most let's say their their sweet spot. What are the kinds of of solutions that are supporting? Are they heavily independent with a company? Let's say like a we've mentioned McDonald's, so we'll be fair and say Burger King, Wendy's, you know, uh, Chick Fil A that have all the resources in the world to manage their own solution once they put it in place. Or are they maybe more in the smaller scale or even very small scale where they need a lot of help? So I would just look for always try to find kind of the people and the the scale and the fit of the organization to your needs because a company like mine might be perfect for your for one organization and really not very good for another just based on that and it doesn't mean the solutions bad or the people are bad or any of that so I think it's important to do your homework with you know if, if you're a 20 store chain you don't need the McDonald's or the Dairy Queen or the Chick-fil-A solution necessarily you might but you may not and it's important to kind of not get wowed by that and sort of say Huh, I need organizations that are what I want to be next year in size or in three years from now, maybe 500 stores, not 50,000 or something. So I would just say that's an important thing to not overlook. Gotcha. Last but not least, Rich, what are your closing thoughts? Yeah, to uh, George and Frank's points for sure is, is get the professionals in, involved and, and surround yourself with great partners, not necessarily vendors. There's so many people that, that sell things, and I see a lot of confusion at the end user level 
trying to educate themselves. And I think they're doing a really good job at this point now. It, it took them a few years to get adopted to what they need to learn, but I see them taking ownership and learning about the technology first before they start sourcing uh, partners. So strategic partners uh, for us are key, and, and you see you're able to recognize when something goes really well and you put those ingredients together and it's a key group of people or expertise that make that uh, solution successful. And the value of a small pilot program uh, shouldn't be underestimated. I've seen so many situations where they start to deploy only to realize that budget was a, a driving factor but the performance didn't meet their expectations and suddenly they come back and say, well, we didn't have time to do it right the first time, but we made we had to make time to do it right the second time. And so, some of our biz, biggest projects end up in that situation where we're actually designing systems around the method of deployment uh, that work best for the integrators, uh, the software companies, and the end user alike. So, great. Well, with that, um, I don't see any other questions that have come in. So uh, on behalf of the Digital Science Federation and the Education Subcommittee, I want to thank you three for taking time out of your day to share all your insights and knowledge and stories. So that, that's fantastic. Uh, for all the attendees out there, thanks for participating. Again, if you've got any suggestions, any advice, topics you'd like to see in the future, uh, reach out to us at the Digital Signage Federation, or if you just want to get involved, you know we're we're looking to advance and better the digital signage community. So we we love you to take part in that. So with that, again, thank you guys. Thanks everyone for attending, and uh, happy creating your digital menu boards. Thanks you Thanks. guys. Take care. Thanks. Take care.